of the basilisk. Let's get straight into that. Leonard adjusted his hard hat to allow the sweat to flow down his face and neck. He was there to inspect the work of the demolition crew and to pick up some artifacts they discovered. The old row of houses would soon be replaced by new lines of townhouses in the gentrification project of which his company was a part. The crew working on the house he currently entered was literally out to lunch, and so it was a good time to check to see that they had followed regulatory guidelines and that any retrievable materials were properly set aside for the benefit of the Lucan Reclamation Company, rather than filched for personal or side projects. This structure had been well maintained from the time it was built, and so there should be some treasures. After several attempts to sell or rent it, the place had been abandoned for some time. But the urban blights had spared it some of the indignities inflicted upon nearby structures. It was not painted in some ridiculously garish hue. No drug users or street people had taken up residence, at least not for long, and very little vandalism had occurred. He only noticed all of this because of the stark difference in the conditions between number 79 Elder Street and the surrounding contemporary houses. The rest of the neighborhood resembled a war zone that had gone through several phases of economic depression, followed by more street wars, with rioters and various gang fractions proclaiming their territories via graffiti and other symbology. Leonard had something specific in mind. The foreman had called him about a few concerns, and there had been an inordinate number of mirrors in the old house. Boss, I tell you, Pauly had said into the phone, clearly shaken. There's mirrors on every single wall, even in the closets and in the shower stall, above the tile. Oh, it's freaky, man. Oh, we collected them and they're boxed. We can load them when you get here. And we got a wall safe too, already removed, along with the wall. He laughed nervously. There's some strange little animals here. They look kind of like long skinny rats. One of the guys said he thinks they're ferrets. I looked and they ain't rats and I checked the interwebs on my phone. Looks like ferrets to me too. They eat rats and stuff. Just as well, but they scare the crap out of us. They jump out and make a little screeching noise and they piss. Whew, it stinks. And with that stellar report, Leonard had made his way over to the site to see for himself. And he'd been excited by the safe find. Several homes in the area had had them as well at one time or another, but the years and the intrusion of the grubby human hands had removed the contents from any that had not been cleared by their previous owners. None the mirrors, well, they could possibly be reused or perhaps resold. Custom pieces. Not a bad day for him as a reclamation supervisor. The other materials, cabinets, antique doors and other fixtures would be processed in bulk but he had handled the specific, possibly valuable pieces on behalf of company management. He found the box mirrors easily enough, and there were 15 boxes in total, enough to account for the six or seven functional homes of comparable size. Freaky indeed, he thought as he considered whether they would fit into the cargo area of his van. And there it was, under one of the boxes and covered with a piece of tarp, just as Paulie had said it would be. He carefully moved the large box and lifted the plastic to view the great treasure beneath. It was plain enough, with an old combination lock. Probably nothing much inside, maybe even empty. Rare that anyone would move and leave behind the contents of a safe. Yet, Leonard had a gut feeling that this one was special, that it would hold something of value. And he was startled by the sound of a high-pitched chittering screech that arose from behind and beside him. He stood, hard racing, and muscles tightening. And there stood several little critters. Ferrets, maybe. Weasels? He didn't know. He knew that the slinky beasts ate rats, mice, and snakes, so despite the musky smell that he had now noted, he decided that they must be decent enough creatures. He'd heard that the feral ones could become rabid and were sometimes bold and vicious. He stomped in their general direction. Ha! Get out of here! Stink pots, he said in a loud voice. The animals merely stared at him with their dark glinting eyes, slightly inquisitive but 
mostly hostile. And then each in turn whirled and disappeared into various spaces around corners. The last, the largest, continued to stare for a moment, and then announced Cheateresque Cheat before it too fled back towards the interior of the house. Leonard offloaded a last of the boxes at the storage facility and then wheeled the safe into some space. Since it was part of his duties, he had gotten certified as a locksmith, and so he prepared to crack the safe, only to find that it, it was unlocked. He grinned at the ease of which he had solved the puzzle, and turned the handle to open the door to the light of day for the first time in what he assumed was years. Paulie shrugged, even though he was on the phone conversation. I don't know, boss. We helped him load the mirrors and the safe and he said he was taking them to the storage place. We never seen him no more than that. We're almost done here. The heavy crew can come in tomorrow. Nothing else worth saving. He hung up his cell phone with relief. A couple of his crew had stopped to eavesdrop. Rather than give them a hard time, he knew that one of the best ways to shift their focus was to ask them questions. Hey, any of you guys know where else Leon might have gone and after he had left here? Nobody had seen him since then. As he suspected, no one had more information and not knowing the answer to his question made them shift their focus from speculative thought to physical labour. Thank you for coming so quickly, sir. At this point, we have no real answers. The manager here at the storage lot noticed that Leonard had not come back through the office by closing time and found him out here like this. The patrol supervisor informed Everett Manon, Vice President of Operations for the Lucan Reclamation Company. Well, have to have an autopsy report to even determine what happened to him. Do you know of any medical conditions he had that may have led to his sudden passing? Well, Everett shook his head. No, as far as I know, Liam was as healthy as a horse. Had to be. There were physical duties in his job requirements. He was pretty energetic and excited before he left the office this morning. You say that he opened the safe that the crew found? What was in it? Well, we really shouldn't discuss that between you and me. The patrol supervisor leaned in closer. Just some odd, glittery looking dust and a strange odor. Weird, but hardly a great mystery. Since there was a death involved, they'll test the dust. Look, the detectives will probably want to speak with you, if you have the time. Everett was relieved that the owner of the company had made the call to Leonard's next of kin. That had to have been a tough one. He was relieved that he hadn't had to look in their eyes at such a terrible moment. The whole thing was appallingly strange. He had no idea what had happened to poor Leon. Maybe some kind of aneurysm or heart failure. And whatever it was, he had to go out and complete the inventory of the storage area. The investigators have released the bin since there was no immediate indication of foul play and the boxes were sealed with invoices attached. They'd taken extensive photos and dusted for fingerprints, likely did some other tests, and there'd be some mess to deal with, but better than facing a grieving family. The next morning, Everett got an early start. He returned to the storage facility and opened the bin room where the mirrors were stored. He spent the next couple of hours or so sorting through the mirrors, most of which were fairly plain. There was one that was odd though. It was incorporated into a box. The mirror was the lid of the box, and he thought it odd that the reclamation team had enlisted it separately. And there was a latch lock on the side, so it likely hadn't been opened, and just overlooked among the plethora of other reflections. It was a simple matter to get the lock disengaged and he opened the lid a little hesitantly, recalling that Leon had died while inspecting the contents of the safe from the same house. Nah, just the woolies from observing death so recently, he thought dismissively. He sat on an empty crate to examine the potential treasure. It opened smoothly and he gave a quick breathy laugh of relief. He'd half expected it to creak like in some B-horror movie. Inside was a book with a plain green cover. No human skin bindings or other indications that it might be a copy of the Necronomicon or other similar sinister tombs, he grinned to himself. 
He set the box aside carefully. It was one of the more valuable pieces in the collection itself. And there was sufficient light in the hallway of the indoor storage unit building that he could easily read the contents of the volume. Shaky but legible cursive text proclaimed that the owner and author had been one Raymond Halsey, PhD. The date under the name was August 1st, 1969. I decided to begin this personal journal to mirror my professional logs. The last expedition of which I was a part of was raided by professors with more tenor, and I was left with a peripheral player in what should have been my seminal work. This time, I intend to maintain my own record, and I will receive credit for my efforts. At least there will be no travel involved. One of my new friends in the newly formed Socialist Republic of Macedonia managed to ship out several containers of artifacts in the confusion of the still turbulent government operations. I would indeed have academic freedom as the first to review the items outside of my colleague. He included a note that he had been able to conduct only the most cursory examination of the pieces before the regime sent inspectors. I mention this because my friend has put himself at considerable risk in the name of knowledge. The crates were reasonably large, and each contained several carefully packed cartons. We'd been looking for one of the holy grails of archaeology, the legendary tomb of Alexander the Great, when the politics of the region, indeed the world, intervened, much as they had in Alexander's time. These items were discovered in the tomb of one of his officers, who had returned to Macedon after the death of Megas Alexandrus. August 2nd, 1969. The first carton I opened contained a magnificent cuirass of bronze, clearly the possession of a significant noble. It was in reasonably good condition. The leather straps, of course, were gone to the ages, but despite the verdigree that had collected over the ensuing centuries since the entombment, it was still a magnificent piece. On the front was a serpentine emblem picked out of the onyx chips that I believed, based on the enormous eyes depicted in amber, and the crest in rubies might be a basilisk. Much like warriors who incorporated Gorgons or Medusa herself to elicit fear and freeze those opponents in terror. Symbolic, of course, but it was in the collection. The theme would likely extend to the man's shield device. Or indeed, the helmet and the shield incorporated the scowls and coils of a serpent. I still had no idea of whom the warrior chieftain may have been. Lakov had not had time to include more than a few notes and photos of what had found them in the tomb. And of course, a map. The map was a tourist great affair with routes and locations picked out in red ink. I needed to look at the written material more closely. I had been so overwhelmed and distracted by the initial items that I didn't use normal protocol and first review the written materials. My Everett looked up startled. A police officer stood in the corridor and eyed him suspiciously. Sir, we're here to look into the incident. What are you doing? My Everett sat down the book, slightly annoyed at the interruption. It had begun to be an interesting tale. My name is Everett Manon. I am reviewing items recovered by my company, the Lucan Reclamation Company. The supervisor yesterday said that I could continue to work on our recovered property and that they were done with processing the crime scene. The officer nodded. I see. It's just that we had a call about an incident in the front office. A customer found, well, he found the body of Mr. Gupta, the owner of the facility. Maybe you should come up front with me and talk with the investigators. Amazing, declared the slim detective. The two unusual deaths in as many days at the same location. We may have some sort of toxin or something inside the controlled climate storage area. Now we have the same witness on scene who discovered the body from yesterday. Could be a coincidence. He trailed off as Everett and a patrol officer approached. He greeted Everett and introduced himself as Detective Holmes. No, not that Holmes. 
He was temporarily ensconced in one of the small side offices. The EMS team had cleared the body as deceased and the crime scene techs were now working industriously to process the scene. Mr. Everett, you were on the scene of one of your company's leased bins yesterday. He asked us a question, but Everett understood that the investigator wanted him to tell his tale. Yes, I found the body of one of our supervisors yesterday. I was sent over to check up on him to see if he was in the bins and out of the cell range. We hadn't heard from him since around lunchtime. I found him. Or his uh, body, that is. Uh, in the bin, next to the doorway. He just opened a safe that one of our teams had found in a deconstruction project. I'm sure you know all of that, though. The investigator nodded. Yes, sir. Uh, thing is, there are many coincidences involved. Parallels, if you will. We were about to come looking for you since your name was the most recent on the entry log. Does anyone from your company know that you are here this morning? When Everett nodded and after a few calls back and forth, he established that he had been in the bin area for the past three hours. Mr. Gupta had been dead for at least two hours, likely a little more. However, as the questions for Everett once again became more intense, one of the techs called out to Detective Holmes. Hey boss, got a security recording. You need to see this ASAP. Detective Holmes stood beside the tech who was seated at the company's security system, gloves and protective gear in place to ensure that he did not contaminate the scene. The recording system is motion activated, pretty standard, switches from intermittent to full speed recording when the sensor is activated. You can see Mr. Gupta arrive and open the office. Then Mr. Mannon arrived and signed the lock. Well, Mr. Gupta went back inside his private office but came back out front of the desk shortly thereafter. Oh, that's, that's where it gets weird. The two police employees watched the recorded material. And Gupta bent to reach into the cabinet below the front desk. He stayed in that position for nearly a full minute, unmoving. And then he quickly straightened to fall limply to the floor, clearly unconscious and likely deceased before he landed. After a few minutes, the system stopped recording in real time, since there had been no motion. On screen, the next time a person entered, it was the witness who had discovered Gupta's corpse. Everett had not come back to the office at any time. It was clearly a coincidence, and Holmes, well, he felt a little disappointed. Should have known it. Would it have been that easy? Guy would have been crazy to kill people and stay on the scene. Shannon packed up her materials carefully and prepared to leave the latest crime scene. It was the second time she'd been to this location in as many days and pretty much the same kind of scene. Deceased male, no obvious signs of trauma, and just eyes wide open and bulging. Jaw slack and gaped in a look of horror. Something weird she had overheard Holmes comment about. Toxins. She was momentarily tempted to hold her breath. Silly, she thought. Just a panicked reaction. The fleeting idea gone before it fully registered. She carted out the smaller equipment items first and then came back for what she called the beast box. Oh, it was closed, but the latches had not been engaged. Odd. She didn't recall closing the lid. Another fleeting thought, forgotten almost immediately. She wanted to get away from this scene as quickly as she could, within protocols. At her office, she unloaded samples of materials and completed her evidence log for each item from the scene. She sighed. This would take the rest of the day, just as the scene yesterday had kept her at work long into the evening. At least her boyfriend had been understanding. Besides, he had some new games and a gourmet coffee to keep him occupied. She had been home at the regular time this evening, just as well. She was feeling a little tired, and with a long day yesterday, and a continued intensity today. Everything else was done, only the beast box was left, and she pulled up the chair next to the thing and popped the latches. No point in lifting the monstrosity, unless she absolutely had to. She actually liked the case. It could safely hold all the biohazard materials and contained a mini lab for unseen work, mainly to preserve what they had found. 
she raised a lid and froze. Before her, enormous golden eyes held her gaze. A figure rose smoothly into her periphery, but the eyes held her attention. Such exquisite eyes, so perfect, so mesmerizing, so terrifying. The gaze turned to liquid fire and engulfed her consciousness. About half hour later, her phone dinged and the text that her boyfriend sent to check in went unanswered. August 4th, 1969 So many fascinating items. Still unsure the name of this officer, but he'd clearly been with Alexander and had tramped all the way to the far reaches of the campaigns. Latest item, a chest, simple and box-shaped, very well preserved, and with bronze fittings and bits of reflective glass and stones inlaid over the surface. Odd, certainly not Macedonian, likely Persian or even Indian in origin. August 6th, 1969 the chest had resisted all methods to open it without causing damage. The weight suggested that it holds some heavy items. I had an x-ray performed on it this morning and the results are interesting. An object definitely resides inside. A mirror of polished bronze. Quite common and a curved, possibly coiled object. Like a large snake but with some type of odd crest or crown upon its head. And I believe it to be some piece of valued artwork along the same lines as the heraldry of the ancient officer. I will have to conduct more research on the basilisk. Perhaps the myths will provide further clues as to the mystery warrior's identity. August 7th, 1969. Calamity. My colleagues have stopped by to inquire about the x-ray I ordered. Apparently, I should not have asked the technician to keep it quiet it obviously found some benefit or reward in reporting it to my academic rivals. I was able to stall them, but now they'll be watching. I'm taking the chest back home with me for further study. I should have left everything at home, but, but I don't have the lab I need in my little row house. And time is pressing. August 8th, 1969. The chest has a lock-in mechanism after all, revealed upon a closer examination of the X-ray images. It is a puzzle, but which one for which I am eager to find a solution. Obviously, a work of great value resides in the container. August 11th, 1969 I have solved it. I felt the lid disengage after I pressed a combination of the most reflective materials embedded on the outside casing. The seal broke open and a foul stench emanated from within a golden glitter and dust sifted upwards from the slight opening. I turned away from the chest, coughing and sputtering to get the dust from my respiratory system. And while I was turned away, I chanced to look into the mirror on my living room wall and I froze in place, throat still rattling in discomfort. Behind me, I saw a figure rise impossibly from the chest. A serpentine figure, much like a cobra, with an odd red crest or crown on its head. The eyes horrified me and made me feel as though my brain was on fire. I knew in that moment that it was the legendary monster I had recently studied. A basilisk. I managed to avoid turning, though the creature exerted its will that I should do so. I fought it until the eyes occluded and the figure struck like a typical viper. The large open mouth gaped and shot forward, but no fangs sunk into my flesh, only a dried globule of desiccated venom. The wad of a consistency with dried chewing gum that was so often stuck in the underside of the student's desk struck my jacket at the level of my belt. I stepped forward out of striking range and the serpent slivered from out of the chest onto the floor and into my kitchen. I glanced at the wad of dried, pure poison on my floor. It smoked. It was clearly highly acidic. I pulled off my jacket and saw that there was a neat hole in the back where the wad had struck. Later, 
when I removed my belt, I found a similar burned circle, all from a strong but brief contact with a venom that had been dormant for a millennia. I didn't know what to do, whether it was safe to look around for the creature. I knew the mythology involved. A mirror would keep me safe from its gaze, but I couldn't walk around with a thing to hunt the creature. Besides, dried out with age or not, the venom was deadly. How would I be able to turn and face and fight this monster, this creature that was alive beyond all reason or logic? I poured some powdered cleaner that contained bleach onto the still, smoking spot on my floor. It seemed to neutralize the venom and the smoking stopped. And then I heard a rustle of dried scales that scraped across the tiles on the kitchen floor. I fled my home and slept in the office of my university. I'd have to research the ancient myths to find a way to defeat the creature. I ever put down the journal. The story was pretty strange. This guy had perhaps been one of those cliché absent-minded professors, yet there may have been more to it. The mirrors. Maybe he'd been a nut. Several mental disorders included hallucinations and delusions. His writing indicated some paranoia. He started from his reverie as his phone loudly jangled out an obnoxious tune. He quickly checked the caller ID and then answered. Hello, Mr. Lucan. How may I help you, sir? Everett, I just received a call from the detective that's been working on the storage facility case. Seems that one of the technicians was found dead at the police department. They are worried that it's some kind of toxin. Since you've been on the scene of the two deaths, they are advising that you get checked by your doctor. Don't worry, we'll cover for you, but, but I think you should stay out until we get you medically cleared. And of course, he had to agree, and it would give him time to continue looking into the journal and take care of some other pending chores at home. He went online and scheduled an appointment to see his physician in the next two days. He determined that he had been extra careful and quarantined away from the kids until then. When he thought of his children, he recalled where he had heard the name Basilisk. It was in some of the books and the movie that the youngsters adored. He remembered that one being monstrous in size, but soon discovered that while the legendary creatures had been large, they were by no means gargantuan. Still, there were many consistencies with what the professor had described. Nah, he internally shook his head. That old guy would have had access to the same information, just more of his mental issues. Captain Papadopoulos had charge of the night phone at the police department. It had a mobile transfer system, but someone had to be there at the nerve center of the department, at least in his mind. The dispatch office down the hallway enclosed the employees, who worked in a communication hub. He considered himself the central figure. There had been some personal issues in that hub and he wanted to be there to keep an eye on them. He screened calls on his radio. He had a habit of charging out to any call that he felt that the supervisors and officers would not be able to handle without him. He was a little rattled by the death of the evidence tech and felt a need to be on hand just in case. He didn't buy the story of the toxins. He read about how certain drugs and drug components could penetrate the skin and cause death. She had likely been careless in her handling of some illicit substance. What was that? He paused in his contemplation and an absent-minded manner in which he'd been playing a video game on the city's computer. He felt some odd stir in the air and looked around for the source. Nothing. As he prepared to resume his game, he felt a tug at the back of his mind a desire to look over the front edge of the patrol office desk. An odd, musky odour emanated from that area. Probably a stale mop, stupid cleaning crew. He thought as he rose to peer over the edge and assuage his curiosity. Those eyes, those blazing pits of golden flame. They locked his gaze and showed him the depths of terror that resided within them and within his own soon shattered and fading psyche. 
A later review of the surveillance recording may have shown a shadow that slivered through the lobby doors alongside a departing employee at the end of the late night shift change. August 13th, 1969. I stayed away from my home as long as I could manage. I needed fresh clothes at a minimum, and frankly, I wanted to resume control of my personal space, my individual realm. I couldn't hide from the situation forever. I stalked through the house by using the mirror to check around every corner and to look into tight spaces before I entered. I had a strategy, but it would take time. I picked up several items I needed and gathered some clothing. And as I picked up the small suitcase, I heard the crash of a delicate object as it struck a hard surface. I was startled and dismayed. I knew that it was something from my mantle, likely a ceramic piece from my childhood, the little statue of the Blessed Mother that my grandmother had gifted me. For all the grief of losing it, the sound of the shattering icon had saved my life. I had grown careless and failed to use the mirror, yet the noise, while it startled me, drew my gaze instantly to the floor beside my right foot, rather than to the fireplace. I employed my little hand mirror, and there it was, coiled just in front of the screen for my hearth. The golden eyes shimmered in anger and frustration, and then faded into a blank reptilian stare. I felt the tug at the edge of my mind, much more intensely than the previous incident, but managed to resist. I tore away my consciousness and fled my home once more. Everett flipped to the photo paper-clipped onto the next page. It was of a cage with a trio of weasels. The caption at the bottom read, Herbert, Winnie and Dot, my soldiers. And there was no fresh entries until August 15th, 1969. I was finally able to locate the best options available. One, several crates of mirrors to place all over the house. Two, weasels or similar creatures were the only true predators for the basilisk. Our lab had some, and I needed them more than I did the animal behavioralists. I entered my front door and used the hand mirror to check the entrance. Before I picked up the cage and carried it into the front room, I lifted the gate and released the three wiry bits of fur, muscle and teeth to go about their hunt. They quickly scampered away from me and disappeared into the darkness of the interior of my house. I used the mirror to make my way to the second bedroom, which I converted into an office. It was the master bedroom, but I used it for a home office, since it was bigger than the space I used for sleeping. It contained a wall safe, which was part of my plan. I placed the original container from which the creature had arisen against the wall, just under the safe and arranged the door so that I could drop it with a string. I will admit that I was a little silly with such a dangerous serpent, but I had great hopes that my allies would drive the beast into its familiar lair, or better yet, slay it for me. I took my place seated on the floor on the other side of my desk. And I had set up a mirror against the wall so that I could peer at the doorway and see anything that might enter the room. It appeared shortly. I don't mean that I watched it slither and coil. It simply appeared. It coiled at the threshold and raised its head and those eyes. It no doubt knew of my presence. It glided forward, its revolting body undulating closer to me. And I thought I was doomed. But then, like tiny warriors, I heard the chittering squeaks of my three best friends. The basilisk whirled to face the threat, and a battle ensued in my home office room. The serpent indeed spat and struck out at each of the attackers, until both Herbert and Winnie had suffered mortal wounds. Perhaps it had venom, after all. But as it struck down the larger Herbert, little Dot managed to take hold of the thing by the base of its skull, just below its crown, and drag it towards the ancient chest. Or that she knew what to do, but perhaps it was some kind of instinct 
to force the creature into a confined space. In any case, once both were inside the trap, I sprang it. I ensured that the lock was engaged and then sat about installing mirrors to cover every angle in the house, just in case. August 16th, 1969. I pressed the combination to unlock the lid and lifted the chest to the level of the wall safe and then opened the sliding door once more. I felt the weight shift and then lift as at least one large creature left it along with a portion of glittering dust that puffed through the unsealed connection between the chest and the safe. I dropped the valuable container and slammed the door of the safe closed. I caught a glimpse of one eye as the thing whipped its head towards me. I instantly felt ill as I engaged the latch on the safe but did not have the presence of mind to spin the dial and lock it. I was incredibly weak and incredibly nauseous. I vomited onto the floor of my office. After a moment spent struggling to rise from my hands and knees, I checked the chest, which had landed on its base. Alas, the tiny heroic corpse of Dot rusted inside. I added the remains of her little band of fighters and closed the lid. I saw that most of the glittering dust remained within the small tomb and considered it a fitting decoration for the ferocious little warriors. I spent the rest of the night boxing up the materials from the crates that Lakoff had sent and loaded them to take to the university. It took every ounce of my strength, but I couldn't abide the thought of anything from those crates sitting in my home. August 17th, 1969 I have grown increasingly sickly and weak all day as though some poison courses through my system. I am experiencing waking nightmares of a ball of golden flame, like looking into the infant sun born here on Earth. And with the help of some student interns, I managed to get the contents of the crate safely stored in a basement, among other more mundane items. I picked up the rest of the weasels at the lab. Haven't named them yet, but they are freely roaming the house. I have made this entry and I fear it may be my last. As I sit, hungry, thirsty and weak, I stare at the wall safe and I am once more drawn to it. I'll place the journal inside a nice mirrored box to protect it and provide an instant means of defense should anyone find it and seek the contents of my wall safe at the same time. And hopefully they will open the mirrored box first. Everett closed the journal and set it on his own homework desk. It was indeed the last entry. No doubt the man had perished. Yet, what of the freaky tale? Why would the man make up such a story? It was no challenge to do some internet research. He found that there was indeed a Professor Halsey, who worked at the university, and there was a note that the man had died of unlisted causes. He was able to search his own company records, to find the list of known previous owners of the house at 79 Elder Street. And there he was. A relative had claimed the property after his death and used it as a rental property until she too died. The property eventually reverted to the city and county for unpaid taxes. It had remained in loss litigation for two decades. He sighed and rubbed his head in his hands. He'd already looked through the boxes and crates, and there was nothing ancient in any of them. No artifacts of a lost world or tomb. And besides, he was no archaeologist, just a working stiff who'd done well and promoted. He considered contacting Detective Holmes, but quickly discarded the idea. Oh, he'll want to know why I didn't surrender the journal. Still, there was a dead technician at the police department and a potentially dangerous animal and he refused to think of it as some ghost monster on the loose. He heard the doorbell and the voice of his wife as she greeted visitors. More officials. And this time, they were with the health department and he soon found himself in a university hospital facility, quarantined along with several members of the police department. And they were there for extensive tests to determine if there was a disease or toxin loose in the community. His wife and kids were on a home lockdown 
in case of secondary infection. And as he lay waiting for sleep to take him, he looked through the sealed window of the room that looked out over the adjacent campus. I wonder if anyone ever looked in that basement. And too bad he didn't say what building. It was his last thought before sleep claimed him. Charity put away the now clean bucket and mop. It had been a long shift, but at least the building was clean. She stepped out into the hallway to go log out her time for the night when she heard a rustling, slithering sound. She felt a sudden urge to walk towards the dark end of the basement hallway, towards the old storage area that no one liked to visit. The staff who worked in this area all swore that it was haunted and that there were cold spots, unexplained feelings of dread and doors that opened and closed on their own. The cleaning and maintenance crew did their best to keep the hallway clean, but no one actually entered the several doorways at the end of the hallway. Rumour was that the university would soon clean out the facilities and explore using it as a lab space or more likely storage for newer items. Academic management was slow to process, and so she had no idea when or if it would happen. As she completed the rambling thoughts, she found herself in front of the last door on the right, her keys in hand and ready to task. And the key to this door stood out, since it was shiny and unused. She inserted it into the lock and turned it. The lock struck for a moment and then disengaged. She turned the handle downwards and pushed. Dust bunnies swelled away from the entrance and a musty odour attacked her sinuses. The interior was as dark as a cavern. She stood staring for a moment, listening as an awful hiss joined the scrapes of slithering scales. She barely registered the long body that slivered through the now open door. Once it was clear and hidden in the interior shadows, she removed a small plastic doorstop from her pocket. She always carried a few and used them to prop doors for airflow when she mopped. She wedged a piece under the door so that it remained open very slightly, but unnoticeably in the murky corridor. When she left for home, it was with an unexpected sense of accomplishment an almost giddy feeling that she had served her purposes well. Well, Mr. Manning, so far we haven't found any toxins or illnesses, but it will take some time. We are sending lab samples to the CDC National Facility and, and the WHO facilities. Dr. Wu passed on her latest update and gave her odd smile the behind the mask and shield that covered her face tugged at a small scar on her cheek. Everett is started to mentally refer to her as the sinister Dr. Wu, like some sci-fi horror story. Thank you, Doctor. The facilities are fine. I get to talk with my family every day on the laptop and my boss has allowed me to have leave of absence for as long as necessary. I truly appreciate how nice everyone has been. Dr. Wu's smile widened even further and Everett imagined her mouth gaping with sharpened fangs. Maybe I have been here too long, after all. My imagination is working overtime, he thought. As she turned to leave, he asked, Say, Doc, do you know about any old storage facilities on the campus? Maybe for the archaeology department? And she paused and looked over her shoulder. That department is pretty small these days. It will likely be shut down soon. We've transitioned to more research and social advocacy programs in the past two decades. Not much room for outdated sciences. And she resumed her exit process, and he was left alone, his puzzle still unsolved. Denny completed the puzzle and opened the lid to the beautiful antique chest. He sneezed and coughed for a moment, and then felt a strong sense of urgency to leave, forget about the container, and get back to changing light bulbs on the basement level. He all but fled the room, using his small flashlight to guide him. And for some reason, he hadn't wanted to turn on the lights in the storage area. The thought crossed his mind that they may not be working anyway. I don't think anyone has been here in my 28 years at the university. When he reached the doorway, he paused to carefully replace the doorstop as it had been when he entered the room when he'd been called. 
He glanced up just before he set the door in place, and for a split second, not even long enough to register, in his conscious mind, he caught sight of a fiery, golden eye. He turned and vomited onto the corridor floor. He felt weak and terribly frightened. In that momentary glimpse of the eye, he had been pulled into a world of fire and fear, of frightening figures that danced and poked at him and delighted at screams he uttered. His supervisor found him there, huddled in a sweat and vomit-soaked mess, shaken, eyes bloodshot, and starting from the sockets, clearly in abject and ongoing terror. Good thing the hospital is just a couple of buildings away from the science building. You think this one may survive, Doctor? Detective Holmes asked. Dr. Wu shrugged. I don't know. He's pretty sick and has a high fever. It's like he was poisoned. We may have him in ICU quarantine room and a ward next to your other friend, Mr. Manning. Not that they have any contact. And Holmes nodded. Sure hope you guys can figure out what's happening with this toxin or disease or whatever. This is the first one we've found alive. Maybe it's not the same thing. It feels random like a sickness or poison. Yet at the same time, there are patterns. A trail, if you will. He shook himself and realized that he'd been speculating aloud, a habit from working solo for most of his career. Thank you, Doctor. Please, give both of your patients my regards when you are able to. Everett shook in fear and tossed and turned in a nightmare-ridden attempt at rest. The dreams always featured molten, golden eyes that blazed at him in fury. Eyes that knew that he had studied the old journal, that knew that he was aware that the eyes existed, that waited in the dark to feed on the energy generated by human fear. The next time he awakened, he gave up trying to sleep and went back to researching ancient Greek monsters and local news on his little laptop with a limited access. The university blocked many sites that he may have found useful, especially new sites. He would need to get out of this place soon. He had been unable to locate anything else of use online. It was time to do some old-fashioned, in-person research. He especially wanted to see if the basement storage was still intact. Hard to believe that it would be after so long, but it was worth a try. Then he had a thought. The campus community site has mentioned that the university board wants to clear out and reclaim the space in the science building. Maybe they could use Lucan Reclamation Company as a contractor. It would give me a sales commission and satisfy my curiosity. And with poor Leon gone, I could reasonably step in to directly supervise the operation. He switched over to email and got to work. I'll be the first to open that chest since 1969 and the second since. Alexander the Great's time, he thought. Excitedly. Everett had asked the maintenance supervisor to have all of the light bulbs in the basement changed so that he and his crew could safely and efficiently remove and catalogue the items in storage. It will be up to the college officials to determine what to do with each item. He'd been released from quarantine when the deaths and illnesses had stopped and he showed no signs of having anything contagious. Detective Holmes had mentioned something about some shiny particles that a lab reported as having some interesting qualities. Everett could not care less about lab work. He was a treasure hunter at heart, always curious and willing to take chances. Still, he brought along a small mirror. Deluded or not, the old guy who last had this stuff was a professor and likely fairly bright. As they approached the door, in the now brightly lit basement corridor, their guide, a maintenance employee named Denny, indicated that the three doors at the end of the hallway were the storage areas, included the contract. I need to unlock these doors and hope you guys understand that either Dr. Carlisle or his assistant will have to be present during the cataloging process. He should be here soon. Denny opened the doors on the left and center, but paused and simply stood staring at the last door the one on the right. He assumed a slack-jawed expression and his arms drooped to either side in his stupor. 
and at that moment they heard shuffling footsteps approach from up the corridor. I'll be there in a moment. Don't get started without me, called Professor Carlyle. He was accompanied by a middle-aged woman who smiled and remained silent. After introductions and pleasantries, Dr. Carlyle opened the door on the left and stood in the threshold for a moment. I haven't been down here in years. There are many artifacts that have been of great value and many pieces that are mostly, well, junk. Most of the latter is stored across the hallway in room B-32. He was interrupted when Denny slumped to the floor, his eyes bulging red and a look of horror forever frozen on his features. The members of the group rushed to his side while Everett thought, Here we go again. Why am I always present when people fall dead? In journey in sheer and chaos, Everett noted that the door in front of which Denny had stood was cracked open, not locked at all. I should have probably let the professor know. But something tells me this is it, the treasure room. I don't care what he said about it being full of junk. His defiant thoughts led him to send the rest of the team home for the next couple of days. Well, we won't get anything done with all the reports and I think that the professor and his assistant are still in too much shock to help. Let's try again Thursday. We'll start late, about one o'clock. Well, the crew members were happy enough to oblige. They spent most of the workday answering questions by campus police and some local detective. Either way, they would get paid. Everett knew that there were no cameras on the corridor, since there were no classrooms to monitor. It was well lit, though he wasn't sure what he would find in the junk room, and so he carried his big flashlight in addition to his mirror. He paused at room B-32 and listened. It was all quiet, not even the sound of dust settling. He nervously chuckled as he pushed on the door. It whined a little when protest, but there were no horror movie squeal. The interior was dark, and so he fished around on the inside wall for a light switch. No way poor Danny took care of it, he mumbled, yet his fingers found the switch and flipped it upwards. There was light. New fluorescent bulbs in old sockets blinked in fits and starts, and eventually settled into rows of humming luminescence. Everett was pleasantly surprised, and he paused for a moment and used the mirror to check the corners just inside the room. Well, there was nothing in the reflections, and he immediately felt foolish. Just nerves again. After all, I saw a man literally drop dead today. He still felt the need for some caution, and slowly and as quietly as he could, he walked in and started to examine the contents of the mysterious room. It was pretty large, and there was shelving in the back portion to cast gloom despite the bright lighting. In the front were numerous pieces of furniture, and some of it quite nice, but out of style. He considered the value of some of the pieces as antiques, but he was anxious to get to the shelves. He knew that if there was anything of value in this room, it would be in those shadowy stacks. It took several moments and the use of his flashlight, but he located a crate with letters that he recognized as foreign, maybe Greek. This is it. At least one of the crates is real. His mind leaped in anticipation. He found that the big box was sealed, and he quickly located several more, and each looked sealed. Wait, that one by the back wall. It was not only unsealed, but the lid was removed, and the dust nearby was disturbed. He paused and looked at the floor. The heavy dust contained a set of footprints that approached and left the area, and a sinuous, winding track that would be made by a large reptile as it slithered forward. He stepped forward with an increasing sense of dread. The chest with the shining reflective stones rested inside the crate. The lid of the chest was slid open slightly. He used the mirror and the flashlight to check. It was empty except for a portion of glittering dust that smelled rank. He looked around the storage room carefully, always using the mirror, but found nothing. The serpent had left his lair to hide amongst the detritus of boxes, crates and old furniture. Perhaps it had gone to hunt for food. Everett made a snap decision 
and bent to retrieve the chest for the glittering dust. He rushed from the room and carefully closed the door behind him, and he swore that as he exited, he heard a snarling hiss and the scrape of scales. He immediately felt an intense need to reopen the door and re-enter room B-32, yet he resisted and fled as quickly as he could with his burden towards safety of the stairwell and the fresh air and sunlight that would dispel the dark thoughts that attacked his psyche. He spent the next morning at the storage facility looking for an item he remembered from another job and then loaded it and drove back to 79 Elder Street. He wanted to try an experiment and hoped desperately that it would work. The site was now no more than a concrete pad. The home with a tragic story for the archaeologist was now gone other than the concrete slab with a few pipes and fixtures open it. Yet he had the feeling that perhaps there was a lingering life in the area. He pulled the large box from the back of his vehicle and set it on the pad. He carefully removed the plastic sealed bag from his pocket and emptied its contents into the plastic box with a metal cage on front. Now he would have to step back and wait. He came back shortly after sunset and found that his trap had been sprung as it intended. He waited until it was full and activated a remote switch to close it. It was an expensive setup retrieved from a live trapping enthusiast's hoard. Early the next morning, he drove to the university with his big box and ancient chest. He found that the outer door was unlocked and made his way to the basement level. He first set a chest outside B-32, then returned shortly with a large box that contained an angry, chittering mass of sleek, furred bodies. And there were five of the creatures. He hoped that something about the dust, the smell of it, would lure them and keep them there. He had taken the chest so that the basilisk would not have its lair. And he suspected that something about the glittering dust preserved and sustained it. Perhaps a couple of days without it would have weakened the creature. He closed the door to B-32 but had disengaged the old-fashioned lock so that he could again access the room. The corridor was as quiet as a tomb. He shuddered at the thought. He had expected the assault on his mind to begin immediately, but it had not. He felt nothing. No presence. Not even foreboding. He worried that the serpent may have escaped. It may even be now wandering the hallways of the science building. Yet, he noted that his team of small warriors were also quiet, tensed, perhaps angry or scared, but definitely prepared to act. He placed the box near the entrance of the door and opened it slightly, and then lifted the trap gate. The weasels sat for a moment, peered ahead and then, with the largest leading the way, plunged headlong into the room with their war cries of cheat or cheat. They drowned out the scratching of their clawed feet as they slinked ahead to engage their most ancient foe. Everett, mirror in hand, followed them into the crowded room. He had left the lights activated so he could see, though the items and shelves cast numerous deep shadows around the space offered, numerous places from which an ambush could be sprung. In his other hand, he carried another item from a different storage bin. It was a machete. It was one of the extra long models and the plastic handle had been replaced by one of polished bone. It looked piratical and sinister and he had assumed that it would make short work even of a legend, a type of dragon. Then he felt a sudden onslaught at the corners of his consciousness, the urge to lower the mirror and turn to his right to stare ahead. He shook himself and instead swept the blade in that direction. He could not see his target, but he felt its presence. He knew that it would be near, close enough to overwhelm his resolve. As the blade swished through the air and with a slight whistle, he felt a momentary tug along the edge and heard a distinctive tink. He checked the hand mirror and saw a head raise, a head with a red crown. I missed. He thought, and even as he began to lunge away, the mouth of the reptile dropped open in preparation to attack. The miniature pounding of twenty-four little feet sounded, and with six screeches, the weasel sprung their own trap.
That afternoon, Professor Carlyle lifted a lid from a crate and found a magnificent crest. He halted the activities of the reclamation crew to examine the find. No one noted that the dust around the crate had been stirred and moved significantly. The decrepit professor later published an article about the findings in the old storage room. It was an academic sensation, especially the chest that contained the odd glittering dust and the statue of a large serpent made from coils of jet with exquisite amber eyes and a crown of rubies. The only signs of damage or wear were a few chips in the crown and a large section of jet that was missing from the throat. Everett released his new friends outside his own home. He hoped that they would stay in the area and do their useful, natural work. Now, apparently, what had been needed was a larger team. Instead of three warriors, six had been sent, and two still lived. They had dived in, bitten, and dodged the striking and spitting of their adversary. Eventually, the big one had been able to seize the basilisk's throat just below the head. He sunk his fangs and held, despite the thrashing of the serpent. Eventually, it flung him loose, with the large chunk of its own throat still clamped in his jaws. At that point, the mite creature of myth slunk to the floor and coiled. Unlike other snakes, it did not twitch, but lay still and ossified into the treasure Professor Carlyle later found. The two surviving heroes bounded from the cage and ran out about twenty feet. They paused, looked hard at Everett, their dark eyes glinting stonily at their captor. The large male rose on his hind legs and declared, Cheetah is cheat, and then dropped to all fours and slinked into the trees beside his mate. Babylon, June 323. B. C. E. Can you feel the pattern on the armor? Telikos, Strategos, the ultimate general inquired. It is some of the most magnificent we have made for any of our adjutants. I know that you cannot see, but I wish to honor you. I have also had made for you a chest in which to hold your charge when it is not in the war box. A more comfortable piece so that the creature may rest beside you. The mirrors are on the outside. It seems to take comfort in your presence, perhaps because you keep your other charges, the weasel pack, at bay. Though the adjutant could not see him, the Telikos Strachigos smiled. He was nervous around this man, Koinos, who could not see, yet controlled the most effective weapon he possessed, one that had been employed sparingly and judiciously, lest it be unleashed into the wrong company. Telikos Strategos, my internal gratitude that you would wish to protect so humble a servant. The blind man sincerely expressed his appreciation. No one had cared much about him until he inherited the creature of Folklore that had been alive since at least the time of Achilles and was rumored to have been part of the hero's legacy. It seemed to like the nest of glitter and dust that the previous owner had told him had preserved the creature through the ages. As long as he kept it well fed and surrounded by a brace of the undulating little mammals with ferocious attitudes, it refrained from spitting at or biting him. He had no need to fear the eyes. As the great general started to leave the apartment, he paused for a moment in thought. Now that his major campaigns were complete, he would need to eliminate some of his ambitious rivals, men of war rather than governance. As he stood considering, the adjutant opened the new chest and ushered his charge from the larger and more complex container into it. Magus Alexandrus caught just the barest glimpse of a molten, golden eye before the beast slid into its new chamber and he became ill even as he entered the corridor. Wow, 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 wow. And another one, wow. Absolutely superb serpentine story there from the incredible mind of my good brother from another mother, 
Michael G. Lockhart. Guys and girls, I'm sure you guys are looking forward to Michael publishing his wonderful stories as much as I. Keep an eye and an ear out for that. We'll keep you posted as soon as possible. I do believe Michael's tying up a book of about three of his stories, which of course you can lose yourself for a good few hours. Of course, as ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help with the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer, want to get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is DMT Forest of Fear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry. <laughs>